Welcome to a dark room. You had no idea you're coming to a planetarium today, but uh, <laughs> we are, we, we're excited to have all of you here. Um, my name is Israel Haas. I'm the executive director here at the Great River Road Visitor and Learning Center. For how, uh, for how many of you is this your first time here? Hey, this is fantastic. Welcome. And who drove the farthest today? Let's see, I heard somebody came in from Red Wing. Where else? If somebody coming in from a uh, half hour, took a half hour to get here? 45 minutes? Yeah. 45 minutes? Well, anybody beat 45 minutes? I'm Red Wing, but I'm the country. Right now, so it's 45. So it's 45 minutes? Okay, anybody beat 45? 45, 45, 45, 45? Oh, okay. All right. You, get, you do get the door prize. I should have my door prize here. Uh, so welcome. I'm so glad you guys are here. Um, this is su super exciting for me because uh, these are the types of programs that we love to offer free of charge here. And all of, all of what we do here at the, the uh, Great River Road Visitor and Learning Center is free. Uh, it, we charge a little bit for some of the materials here, but uh, generous donors have made this available. We are a partnership between the city and a nonprofit organization. The nonprofit organization that runs this center is the Friends of Freedom Park, and the city owns the, the facility and the property, and we put on the programs. And we are really uh, grateful as well for our bluebird experts today. Come on in. Let's see if we can sneak some seats around here if we need to uh, move around a little bit. Maybe we can find a place for you guys to sit right next to each other. There's a couple in front if you want. And these are my daughters, so they can just stand. <laughs> They're young. Oh, yes. That's right. That's right. right over there. Right over there. Right over there. Oh, perfect. Yeah. Right over here. Oh, back here together. Thank you. Sorry. <laughs> Yeah, we are we are very grateful for uh, Lowell and Jim, who are going to be presenting today, and they come on behalf. They're volunteering their time, and this is what they do. They love to do, um, and I'll let them introduce the uh, the Bluebird uh, organization that they're a part of. Um, afterwards, uh, we'll have a, a presentation here, old school presentation. I love it. Slides brings me back a few years uh, to uh, actually some of those famous we had we had. Last Last time, to be honest with you, Lola, the last time I saw slides like this was for family holiday gathering in North St. Paul in the basement of my grandparents' uh, house. And we bring out the old slides every year. And that was tons of fun. So this will bring back good memories. Uh, and uh, I think you're going to learn a lot about bluebirds today. And you're going to have an opportunity afterwards, if you'd like, to build a bluebird house. So after the presentation, you're gonna learn about bluebirds, and then afterwards, uh, we're gonna take down all the chairs, set up some tables here, it'll just take a couple of minutes for us to transition, and then uh, we have the bluebird box materials all set up over there. Uh, maybe you didn't even know that you had this opportunity today, but you can take advantage of it. We have 20 boxes, and if we run out of boxes, you can take the instructions home and buy buy some cedar yourself and make it can make a, a few boxes for your property. So um, feel free to stick around. And without talking too much more, I'm just going to give it over to Lowell Peterson and Jim Bites. Yeah. And uh, can we give them a hand? As they come up here? Well, thank you, Israel. This is a fantastic turnout. We're so happy today to have groups like this. And I always tell people, you know, bluebirds are an easy sell. I talk to people about bluebirds. Everybody loves bluebirds. And I'm sure if I, I put on presentations to grade school kids, about fourth and fifth grade, and so I always ask those kids, I say, well, how many of you have seen bluebirds or you know what a bluebird sounds like? And almost all of them raise their hands. I'm not sure if they're not thinking about blue jays, but how many of you here have heard or seen bluebirds? Wow, isn't that as amazing? And for the young ones that maybe haven't heard, listen. That sounds like a bluebird, doesn't it? Isn't that amazing? I think it is. Um, I'm with the Bluebird uh, Restoration Association of Wisconsin, organization that was formed in 1986 with the help of the uh, DNR, Wisconsin DNR. A group of people decided, you know, we haven't seen very many bluebirds around Wisconsin anymore. 
And I had talked to a lady one day, she says, you know, when I was a little girl, that's the last time I've seen a bluebird, and now I'm 70 years old. And she said, now, in the last couple of years, through the work of a lot of people, uh, a lot of volunteers, we've constructed nest boxes. Bluebirds are cavity nesting birds. Along with bluebirds, we have chickadees, and everybody knows what chickadees are, woodpeckers, and house wrens, tree swallows. And these birds are native to Wisconsin. They need cavities. And what uh, really happened, the environment changed in the last 30, 40 years. Cavities were no longer so available for these birds. So the populations dropped way down. So this group of people in 1986 got together and they started constructing nest boxes. This is a nest box. Um, it's got a cavity in it, made by human beings, you know? And so, look at that. It's, and the, the birds have really adapted to it. And I've been uh, making nest boxes, putting out nest boxes for 25 years. And uh, I think the best year I ever had with bluebirds is 163 bluebirds fledged. What that means is that uh, they lay eggs, they become, they hatch, and then they become adults. And when they do leave home, they're fledging. 163, that's my best year. I don't know, Jim, what, what uh, kind of years have you had? I can't remember, I just remember the number of boxes which makes you tell yeah. as well. <laughs> <laughs> well, that was, that, uh, I have on the tip of my tongue. It's pretty much uh, dependent a lot on weather. And I know, Kathy, you've, you've been monitoring nest box for a long time. And the weather makes a big difference. Yes. You know, last year, I think some of us remember, uh, about the middle of uh, April, we had the vortex hit us, remember? We had wind chills in the 40 below range in April. And uh, bluebirds are, um, they uh, migrate, and they usually come back when they get food. Well, in the middle of April, if it's the 40 below zero, you're not finding a lot of bugs. And they are insect eaters. What we're gonna do today is, I have about 30 slides, 25, 30 slides. We're gonna show some slides. And I apologize, it isn't on PowerPoint. This is the old projector. I had a uh, projector uh, that uh, was a carousel projector, and some of you maybe have seen some of those. But the ball burned out. In fact, it's burned out twice. This is the last time I cannot find a replacement ball. And I called the company and they, what, a carousel projector? We don't make those anymore. They don't make any parts. So anyway, this is what we're faced with. It works, it's an old, Tough box. But anyway, we're going to show the slides, and uh, we've got some uh, samples here of nest boxes. Jim has brought a lot of, uh, of these props along to show people what uh, uh, things look like and out in the, what happens sometimes out there. I've got a few little uh, sample birds here. I also have some little boxes here that have, uh, this one has some bluebird eggs in it. I put a little note on the top here. This box happens to have been uh, uh, at Willow River State Park at, by Hudson. And uh, I monitored those nest boxes and all of a sudden, here's five eggs. I went back and checked it a week later, there were still five eggs. Another week, five eggs. So the nest box was abandoned by the adults. And there's lots of reasons for that. Some of them get uh, killed or sometimes hit by cars and different things. So anyway, I took those eggs and I, I thought I'd bring it. When I have my sessions with the grade school kids, I show them what it really looks like and so forth. And then there's a couple other things. So you're very free to roam around after we get done here. And so I think what we'll do is get rolling. Jim, you ready to go? Yeah. Okay, let's turn on the projector here and uh, we'll fire off. There's some nest boxes, as you can see. When I uh, put on the presentation to the school kids, they say, well, what's the best box? And I always tell them, well, if it has bluebirds in it, it's good, isn't it? <laughs> and uh, what we have found through the Bluebird Association, we found that bluebirds kind of prefer a smaller cavity. Yeah. 
Some people build uh, fairly large boxes, like you see the one on the left there, that's a uh, box that uh, is fairly big. So when they build their nest, obviously it would require more nesting material. So we found uh, through the monitoring process over the years that they prefer a smaller cavity, easier to build a nest. And one of the fortunate things about uh, Mother Nature does Bluebirds have a very high mortality rate. They say about 1.1 year is average lifespan. Well, with that kind of lifespan, you need a lot of replenishing the cycle. Bluebirds will nest, usually, if the weather's right, two times a year. I've had them three times. Jim, I'm sure you've had triple nestings. That depends a little bit on the weather. The last couple of years, I have not had triple nestings. And last year, with the late spring that we had, I only had uh, about half of my nest boxes had two nestings, otherwise just one. But next year, if we get an early spring like we may have this year, we could have triple nestings in So that's good. So anyway, nest boxes. Um, there are some examples. We'll talk a little more about that. This one here, a little tough to see. Bluebirds are very territorial. They don't like to have neighbors that are too close. And if they do have neighbors, they will find them because they're very uh, possessive of territory. We recommend about a football field away, 300 feet. terrain that's fairly open. There are insect eaters, and I've had people put up nest boxes in grass that's this tall. They have a lot of difficulty finding insects when the grass is so high. So, um, we have, a lot of people like to put them up in uh, golf courses, or along uh, a right of way along the road. I've got uh, 33 nest boxes that I take care of, and over half of them are on I live out in the country, and they're on country roads. And they have no problem basically finding insects there. So. But house lots in town would be too close if you're going to house houses. Well, that's true. The question, if you live in town, it's pretty hard to get uh, two or three boxes on your property, unless you have a big estate or something. Right? <laughs> but, uh, yeah, that is an issue. So you got to talk to your neighbors and try to spread them out. I have... Nest boxes at the grade school in Somerset, up at St. Anne's School. And they have five boxes on there, right on the playground. And, uh, but, you know, they've got enough property that they can spread them out. I also have a, I have a nest a school right in downtown, uh, out in about the center of Wisconsin. And the teacher asked me, well, do we have enough property to put up nest boxes? I said, well, Tight, I'd say you could get two. And they got two of them, don't you know? They got bluebirds right in downtown. That's amazing. So it is pretty good. And as I say, there's a lot of different styles. I think Jim has one that look just about like that. And uh, the ones that I make are basically like this, which are very similar to the ones that you're going to construct. But uh, we use redwood. Cedar wood doesn't work so quickly. And uh, don't paint them, because we don't need to paint them. With cedar, they'll keep pretty good. You don't want to really want to paint them. And uh, I always use screws. I used to build my nest boxes with nails, using nails, much easier pounding. But I found that if you have any problems with, uh, let's say, wood or something happens. I had a bear come in one day and he ripped, literally ripped the side of the box right off. You know, bears are so strong. So with the screws, I could couple the screws and I'd replace them real quickly. But, so I found that you really want to use screws in the construction and that's what you'll see today. Here's a couple nest boxes. You say, well, gee, that's not 300 feet. And no, it isn't. There was a 
movement a while back of pairing nest boxes, mainly because of the competition between tree swallows and um, bluebirds. Tree swallows are also native. They're excellent birds. They eat a lot of mosquitoes, and uh, they're fairly aggressive. They come back a little bit later than the bluebirds, and if a bluebird has started a nest, tree swallows will come, and they'll gang up on that adult. And uh, before you know it, the tree swallows have taken over the nest box. So the argument was, well, if we put up two nest boxes close together, bluebirds will take one, tree swallows will take another. Well, we had a gentleman that was by the name of Joel Halloran. Joel uh, put up some spreadsheets on uh, a computer. And by sending in our data from monitoring, he determined that we were better off keeping our nest boxes further apart if we wanted to increase the numbers of bluebirds rather than pair them. So anyway, I used to do that. I used to pair them. So I started moving them apart, and I get more bluebirds. Now. So that's just something. But the man, lady that said, you know what, I can't. I don't have 300 feet. So you probably want to. You could try it. You're not going to get bluebirds in both of them because they'll fight. They will fight. So. And T posts. Everybody knows what a T post. Part of the reason that uh, the habitat change was that farmers used to use wooden posts for their fields. Was one reason. And woodpeckers, our dear old friendly woodpeckers, would come along and make holes. I think Jim had one right there on that post. Look what the woodpeckers can do. And there's a cavity. The other thing that Mother Nature does, woodpeckers do not use the same cavity two years in a row. They'll build a new cavity next year. Aha! There's a house made for our cavity nesting birds. Pretty amazing. Right? So anyway, uh, I, I think it's just wonderful to uh, get to know how this all works. But peoples, very rigid, last forever. And with the use of, uh, we'll talk about predators or another factor. You know, the, I always say, bluebirds have a tough life. They, the weather's rough on them. They have neighbors they don't like, and they don't like the bluebirds. And uh, they got predators that like to eat bluebirds and eat their eggs. So what does man, Mother Nature do, as I said before? Double nests, maybe triple nests. Pretty amazing. But uh, we put PVC pipe on our nest boxes like this, and with the T-post, you can slide this right over the T-post. Makes it very difficult for the raccoons to climb the PVC. They can do it, though. <laughs> <laughs> They're pretty, pretty shrewd. And raccoons, you know, your hand has got a thumb. Raccoons have a paw that is so close to our thumb, a hand, it's amazing. They can, you know, handle that thumb just like we can. They can, uh, uh, there's a gentleman down in uh, La Crosse, and I think uh, Jim knows him. He uh, filmed, put the camera out at night, and he's got it on film where a raccoon came, and by hugging the pipe, he shimmied right up that PVC pipe. <laughs> And once they can get a hold of the wood, and he's on top, they can reach right in there and grab the babies right out of it. It's amazing. So I sometimes, I, I haven't had trouble with raccoons where I live, but some people will take car wax and wax the post. And it makes a difference. It does help. So anyway, another little thing. Do squirrels bother you No, squirrels won't. They, they're not the one. You, you will find woodpeckers, though, that, as I, we showed, though, they will also make uh, oh. enlarge the size of the hole. Oh. Here's an ideal spot for a bluebird box. Got an open pasture field, um, got steel posts there, so that's a good spot. And uh, size of the hole, you'll find uh, directions for making nest boxes on our website, and I'll 
just mentioned that if you do have the uh, ability to get into a website, bra, B -R -A -W dot org. And it's a lot of colorful pictures. It gives you a lot of good information as to where to place your nest boxes. And there's also box plans. I think Israel made some, so and maybe we'll be able to. But that is a very good website to braw.org, and it's very, very easy to look for. Eastern Bluebird. Uh, that's what we have in Wisconsin, Minnesota, this part of the country. Uh, they're Eastern Bluebirds. There's actually two other kinds of bluebirds. One is the mountain bluebird that's out in the, say, the Black Hills, uh, Rocky Mountains, and then there's the western. That, uh, and I have seen the, uh, the mountain bluebirds. Beautiful bird. We'll show a picture of them. But they're about the same size as the eastern bluebird. And so here's a male on the right and a female on the left, and they're. I guess talking about when we're going to get started on building our nest, you know. So. And this is the mountain bluebird. Uh, very beautiful. They don't have the uh, uh, copper breast or the orange breast that uh, the eastern birds. And bluebirds can grasp, but right on the outside of the nest box, somehow they can actually grasp. And I always have uh, fun with my uh, some of the other people that are on the board of uh, the book Rod. And uh, we recommend that you put a little sock cut in that door so they got something to hang on to. Well, and we're so smart. We said, well, what about putting someone inside for the little babies? You know, all those little cuts? Well, I always, I, I tell them, well, birds do before we got involved. <laughs> How do they climb in and out of these holes? So we, we have a little fun with each other. Mealworms. Um, they're insects, and bluebirds just love mealworms. You can purchase these at, say, Fleet Farm or some of the bird stores, and uh, people do feed them. I tried it a few years ago. I put a little bowl, a little saucer, and I put it right down below my nest box in my yard. And so I put about 25 little worms in there. Go back next day, and all the worms are gone. I said, wow, that bird is hungry. And so I did that about three, four, or five days. But you know, I never saw the bluebirds eating those worms. So I thought, hi, George. I'm going to put some out there, and then I'm going to stand back and just kind of watch what happens here. Well, it wasn't about 10 minutes. Here, a bunch of ants were coming. Oh. And uh, they were carrying away my mule. And so I took care of that. And another story about this. Uh, some of you folks that live up towards the Richmond Somerset area, we have a fish and wildlife as a uh, facility up there. And I put on a presentation there about five years ago. And the gentleman came up afterwards and he had a picture of Birds and Blooms magazine. And some of you maybe have seen that magazine. And he flipped open a page and there was a picture of a human ham with mealworms on it and a bluebird, a young bluebird, was eating the mealworms right out of the palm of his hand. And I had heard about that before. He said, that's my hand. So I said, well, how long did it take you to uh, encourage that bird to come up to you? He said, well, I put my bluebird box on uh, my deck. And he said, I go out there and got, they got to know me pretty well. But the adults were always afraid of me. They would never come real, real close. But when the little ones fledged, they weren't afraid of me. <laughs> and he said, these are the little ones that would come to meet others. And he said it took him two weeks to get him to come up to his hand. So it's pretty amazing. And bluebirds get along with people very, very well. They, they are not afraid of people. Huh? What happened? That piece of wood fell out of the house. Oh. Well, we don't take care of that. I'll explain why that's. And these are bluebird eggs. Uh, bluebirds will usually lay uh, their first nesting five eggs. And uh, the female and the male will both work to uh, construct a nest. And obviously, uh, after, it'll take maybe three, four days before they get it finished, sometimes quicker. But uh, then the female will lay the eggs 
I think she usually lays maybe one egg a day. So it'll take four or five days. And then she incubates the eggs. She just sits on those eggs for about 12 to 14 days. And uh, many times they don't leave, and the male will feed her while she's incubated. Sometimes she'll leave for a short time and come back. And then after those eggs hatch, um, obviously those little tiny creatures have no feathers. And uh, so within about 14, 15, 16 days, they've got enough feathers, they become adults. And they will flourish. They will leave after that period of time. And I, my little uh, students, they're very, they're wise, I'll tell you. They, they'll say, well, you mean it only takes about two weeks? And from time to hatch when they're flying away? And I says, yeah, that's all. And I say, how many of you guys live at home yet? <laughs> and they're all about 10 years old, you know? <laughs> they look at me with their eyes about this big. <laughs> they, they don't. But I tell you, it, it really, they understand then how this all works, this nature, how it all works. And uh, when I first started putting on these presentations, I remember the teacher up at Somerset, she said, Wow. And we would go out and monitor the nest boxes every week on their science class. And of course, the kids were it. And they, she said, you know, they would be looking up in the air at the clouds. They understood about trees. It was just a whole change of a lot of things, just, just from that. There's uh, babies, I'd say, they're maybe about 12 days old. Uh, you'll notice, if you look very carefully there, you might see a little bit of blue tinge on the feathers there. And uh, so they're getting pretty close to the time they'll start poking their nose out of the hole. That they are. <laughs> Tree swallows. Tree swallows, I said, uh, were native. They look a lot like martins, um, and they fly kind of uh, the same way. And they're beautiful. Uh, they look black, but they're actually kind of a real, real iridescent uh, purple. And they do eat it, a lot of mosquitoes. And this is what uh, tree swallow nests looks like. Usually about uh, six white eggs, sometimes seven, most often six. Um, they'll always line their nest with feathers. And I've never totally been able to figure out where they find the, all of the feathers. Sometimes they'll have turkey feathers in there, chicken feathers, and, but they somehow do find feathers sometimes. Uh, house wrens, native to Wisconsin. We all have them probably runs around our yard. Noisy little birds, and they're feisty. They're very, very feisty. And some people don't like them because they compete very, very strongly with bluebirds and tree swallows for a cavity. And if you look at their beak, I've seen them put the run on blue jays. If the blue jays get near, they'll go after the blue jays and out of here. And they're not very big. Um, they uh, tend to come back from migration a little bit later than the tree swallows and the rats. They will, um, maybe uh, the tree swallows or the uh, bluebirds have already started the nest, and in some cases actually have eggs in there. The wren will just move them, punch holes in the eggs, and pull the eggs out. And they uh, make their, I don't know if anybody can see that, they make their nest out of sticks, little, little crates. And it's the male that makes, brings those sticks in. I have three nest boxes in my yard, not all bluebirds. That wren puts sticks in all three of them. And then the female will come along and she will visit these three boxes. She finds the one she thinks is nice. And she'll complete, she'll complete the nest then with grass. She makes a knife, there's a little cup in there, and uh, she completes it, and that's where she will live. And the wren eggs, now here's an example of that, that box with the sticks, I don't know if you can see it well. But 
There's the red eggs. They're brown and they're uh, smaller than the other eggs. But uh, I think an, uh, another thing that's kind of amazing is when people like Jim and I come along, and after the birds fledge, we go in there and clean out the nest box. And people say, well, you mean you want to clean it all? Why do you do that? Well, a couple reasons. First of all, if you have a nest in here, it's probably about that high. Can you see that? And if you don't clean it out, when they make a second nest, then the nest is going to be right up by the entry hole. When those little babies are getting 12, 13 days old, they still can't fly yet, but they see what it's out, and they come out, and they're very, very vulnerable then to predators. So there's a reason why we want to clean it up. Also, although tree swallows are really good housekeepers compared to um, the, did I say tree swallows? I meant the hunting of bluebirds. Bluebirds are very good housekeepers compared to tree swallows. Tree swallows usually only nest once. That's part of the reason why. I think. Can you imagine raising eight or six or seven little birds in there and not cleaning it out? Guess what? Mother Nature has a way to take care of that. Cavity nesting birds cannot smell. Isn't that amazing? They cannot smell. And we always talk about birds, you know, smelling different things, but cavity nesting birds can't smell. And I guess I can understand why. <laughs> are there any flowers that bluebirds are attracted to? They will, uh, they don't eat, the, uh, they will go for the nectar or anything, but you'll see them a lot in, in uh, like, um, oh, uh, crab apple trees sometimes. I have a crab apple tree and it, the bluebirds will come in there, but uh, they don't eat the, they will eat crab apple fruit late in the year when uh, there's the insects that are kind of, uh, and sumac too. They will, you'll see them on sumac branches. Bugs really, because we've had Japanese needles. I don't think anything needs no. <laughs> Robins. Crickets. Chickens. Uh, chickens do. A lot of moths. Chickens. Uh, bluebirds eat a lot of moths that uh, you'll find on the ground. They'll hop down on the ground and they'll find the moths. Mm -hmm. A lot of moths. And here's our old friend uh, Ricky the Raccoon. Why we talked a little bit about him. They're, uh, very vicious on birds and predators. And of course, this one here, I'd like to talk a little bit more about uh, cats. They estimate uh, in Wisconsin about 3 million birds a year are killed from cats, from feral cats. And cats are amazing animals. I uh, have a bluebird box, and they all say, well, I'll keep it at least five feet above the ground. They say cats can only jump straight up about five feet. Well, I think it's probably five feet, six inches, because I have my cat that I have at home. One day I see her sitting on top of the box, and the male bluebird was diving like this, and she was trying to catch the bird as he flew by. So I raised the nest box up to over five feet, and that took care of a few months. When I lived in the country, River Falls, my daughter's cat, Big as it was, long, long and skinny, could sit on the top, smaller than that. And I had to work picking. I don't know how you got up there. Well, they can jump. And he was looking over the hole. They'll, they can jump. They say five yeah. feet straight up. You know, that's pretty amazing when you think of it. Yep. So, uh, cats, uh, if you do have a cat at home, try to make sure your nest boxes are high enough. And don't put them on trees because they will go up there. And of course, the raccoons, too. I don't know if people have a lot of trouble with raccoons. Some areas you have more than others. And uh, I had a big dog, and the dog didn't like the raccoons, so that helped an awful lot to keep the raccoons out of the yard. Anyway, you know. Okay, everybody knows probably what these birds are. They're the English house sparrow. And uh, look at the size of that beak on those birds. They're actually belong to the finch family. And uh, with that heavy beak, you can understand why they would call them the finch. But they will kill, uh, easily kill, 
bluebirds, and many other birds. And they're cavity nesters, and they'll nest almost any place they want to, I guess. I think sparrows are considered the most numerous bird in the world. Because they get along with people very well, and they uh, can eat almost anything. They make their nests out of paper, wax, wax paper, almost anything. And some people say, well, how do you know if it's a sparrow nest? Well, just look at the nest. If it's got paper and plastic and all this other stuff, you know it's a sparrow. And sparrows are not protected. They came here in the 18, about 1880s, and they imported them to go after the bold eagle that was attacking the cotton fields. Of course, they found out that this was a nice place to live. And so we can destroy them without penalty. Most of the other native birds, you cannot, right, you can get penalized. Fines are very stiff, so you don't want to do that. So I put up with uh, wrens. Because once the wren nest is, uh, once the wren babies are fledged, I clean it out. And if the season is long enough, the bluebirds will come in and take over. And I've had that many times, so um, it works. Um, these birds are also the, uh, but they're not native either. And, uh, Starlings. And uh, they're a little bit bigger. I don't think they can get in those holes, so they're not a big time problem. Uh, this particular, I think, that bluebird was killed by a sparrow. It actually fractured its skull. Uh, and that's what woodpeckers can do, as I've uh, got a little bit example. Uh, good reason why we want to use screws and replace the entry door. And these ladies are monitoring the nest box. And what we recommend, uh, if you do put up a nest box, uh, about once a week, eight days, nine days, go and check the nest box. And you say, well, what can I learn? Well, you'd be surprised. And I've been doing this about 25 years, and I swear every year something new happens that I haven't seen before. And um, my wife and I were out checking our nest boxes uh, one day. Um, and we came along, and here's a nest box lying on the ground. And I thought, I wonder what happened there. Because it was on a steel post. Anyway, I opened it up, and there were four little babies in there. They were about three days old. No feathers, or just a couple starting. And it was a day that wasn't as warm as it is today. But those little birds, they could just barely move. They were so cold. Uh, took the little birds in her hand. She warmed them up by massaging them. I rebuilt the nest. We put it back up on the post. I went back an hour later, and the adults were there, and they were feeding those three little birds. That's and they did fudge. They did it. So another reason, if I wouldn't have been, maybe a couple hours later, those all of them would have passed away. And uh, why do we want to? People ask me, well, why, what can we do to take care of a hypothermia? Well, when the sun comes up in the morning, which hopefully it's coming from the east all the time, but anyway, uh, we like to position our nest boxes facing toward the east, south, east. Even that little bit of early morning sun will help warm up the inside of this box. And my daughter lives uh, north of Somerset, about three miles. She called me one a couple of years ago. Dad, she said, I just was out checking the nest and my little babies have all died. And she had five little babies that had died. And that was a very, very cold morning. So what can you do about that? Well, you clean it out and they will make a new nest. They will. They have a strong urge, as you know. So also, by positioning the nest box for the trees, when we have our big thunderstorms around this area, they usually come from the southwest, don't they? And of course, if you get some of those high winds with the rain, it gets quite wet inside, so very easy for them, the little birds to get cold. Once the season gets warmer, it isn't so much a problem. And sometimes people will say, well, boy, with a box like this, it must get so hot in here. Well, it does get warm. 
Wood is an insulator, so it's one reason why we want to use wood rather than, say, some other material. But wood is an insulator. And uh, Bra has done a study on losing birds in the heat. And, you know, someday we get up to 95 degrees with all the humidity. You can imagine how warm it is in I have never lost a bird because of the heat. I've lost some because of the cold, but not because of heat. And, of course, I live in Somerset, which is 40 miles north of here. So, so Prescott might be going that way. But maybe some of you, you know, experience that too. Yes? Question, once they fledge, when, how long is the time period before they have their second nest? Okay, the question, and she asked, uh, how long does it take from the time they fledge till the time they'll start a second nest? Well, if you catch it just right, and I uh, like to keep track of uh, on my uh, little book. I've got a book. Here's what I do. I put a little apron like this. I got some pencils in here, and when I go out, I check my nest box, and then I write down. I put a number on the box, number 22. Uh, I checked it today, and this is what I saw. The babies are about 12 or 13 days old, my estimate. So I say, well, gee, if I'm going to come here in about seven days, they should be fledged. Well, one day I forgot. So when I opened up my nest box, I had five little babies go <laughs> five different directions. They couldn't fly, but they sure could hop. And it took me about 15 minutes for a cotton to put it back. <laughs> but uh, so if I would have remembered that, you know, it's getting pretty close. They're not ready out. They're not out of there, but it's close. So I would have probably just uh, maybe peeked in. I know this nest box, I've, I make a lot of my nest boxes with a hinge on the bottom. And that way I can open it up and peek in there without opening all the way. So, you know, that's something I learned. This happens to be a box I made a while back. But I, I've learned that. And it's probably better to do it that way. A lot of little things you learn with time. But I was getting back to why do we want to monitor in this process? Well, you learn. And then we recommend if you're a member of BRA, which we encourage people to join BRA, and Jim's going to have some good information about that. Here, I'm doing all the talking, Jim, but I hope you got able to. But anyway, uh, we like to do that so that uh, the people that can analyze this data that comes in, we send it in to our law organization, and they put it on spreadsheets, they do some sorting and so forth, and they say, guess what we learned? And they'll publish that in our, um, our uh, papers. In our, our little, uh, Jim will talk about that too. Okay, I think we're getting down to the end here. Um, here's us. We try to encourage uh, our young people to get involved, and uh, by making these boxes, uh, we've done this up at Interstate Park up at St. Clair Falls uh, two or three years in a row now, and they make about 25 nest boxes, and then they're able to purchase them and, and put them up in their yard. But it gets the kids, you know, they got a little closer feeling about doing that, and they enjoy it. Too. Okay, I think that's my last slide, so. Uh, we're going to shut this off. And Jim, I'm pooped out. <laughs> I, I don't have enough handouts to cover this whole group, but I'm going to sum up. When we're finished here, you want to... Jim, you want me to make some more copies? Oh, that'd be good. Yeah. And I'm going to put this on the website on the screen for folks to... This is the one here. Is this okay? Should, the one was right? Yeah. yeah. I'll make more copies. So we we'll talked about that predator guard in a plastic, and uh, I go to Menards and get downspout. It's painted, and you can wax that too, and, and that might be a little more economical for you if you have a lot of boxes. Um, there's a, another thing I want to talk about was black flies. Uh, I can monitor a house, and I, I see four or five uh, baby birds hatched. They don't have any feathers yet. So the following week when I come by, I'm pretty excited because I, I had all these birds and I'm going to look in there and they're all dead. And they got bruises on them, no feathers or anything. But there's something called black flies and you have to have water nearby within a couple miles. And they come in June 
and uh, I think they smell the carbon dioxide coming out of the nest box. That's what I've read. Anyway. So what I could, I've heard about, and it works, is you, you take this uh, dryer sheet that you put in your dryer. This is called bounce. Yeah. Take uh, two or three small pieces of that, and with a thumbtack, just put it on the wall of the nest box. And I don't know why this works, <laughs> but the uh, black flies won't go in there. Because, you know, you're pretty disgusted when you find out they're all dead and they got these bites all over. So that's something I, it's not a handout, but it works pretty good. Jim, my dad used to use strips of dryer sheet underneath his cap on the golf course because he had, he attracted gnats. Oh. And it worked. Oh. <laughs> something, you know, you think, does that smell that bad? <laughs> but I tried to look this up. How does it work? And I yeah. Don't Mo um, we'll talked about raccoons and house cats, wild cats. Um, this is called a Knoll Predator Guard. I think the guy's name is Jim Knoll, but it's made out of wire, which you can buy at Menards or Flea Farm. And uh, on websites about bluebirds, they shall tell you how to fold this and how many squares and so on. But a raccoon is going to get stuck in his hands, and the cats too. So if you make a number of these, you could you could put it right over the front of your, uh, you know, your box. I don't have this in all my houses, but I, I think it's a it's a pretty good uh, invention, and uh, mm -hmm. you can you can find all this stuff online. Uh, Bluebird Restoration Association knew we were ever going to do this today, so they sent along something to attract membership, and at a reduced cost of 10 bucks, where you can go online and view uh, their opinions, and they send you a newsletter four times a year. And that's $10. So they told me, <laughs> if anybody wants it, I'll send them the 10 bucks. It's like this. Yeah, that's it. Very colorful, lots of good information there. Well, most of my houses are this kind. Peterson House, invented by a guy in Minnesota. I used to go to all the Bluebird meetings and uh, advertise his house. And it's got the siding on it instead of uh, cedar or red, redwood. And it, it's a uh, sturdy box. And most of the boxes I put, I'll either put this on or some real sturdy wire and twist it on a T post, a metal T post that farmers use. They don't use wood posts anymore, so we got to help help the birds out. So you can I buy this and we farm. Another, another interesting thing, I don't know how they determine this, but a, a guy in Indiana 20, 30 years ago buys this box because house sparrows don't like it because of all the light that comes in. Oh. So if I have a problem with sparrows, and I should say, don't go buy feedlots or barns because you're going to have house sparrows coming. So you just don't even put one up. You're wasting your time. But I've, I've had some places in, in the uh, Kinnikinick State Park where I had sparrows come. I didn't take my Peterson down. I put this up. And uh, they don't like sparrows. Golf courses, too. There's a lot of sparrows around golf courses. It's called a slot box. And I have about, you know, six, eight of them up. Gotta use that U clamp to put them on there again. Oh, here you go. This is another design that does exactly the same thing as Jim mentioned. Sparrows do not like that. And maybe, you know, here's the roof. Um, I guess what I've heard that sparrows, if you look at their nest, they will build their nest right to the top and they will actually kind of make a little tunnel under the down about this far into the, to get into their nest. That's right. They, and if you do this, they don't like that because they can't get that little tunnel up there. And I, I had an S box by a, a little farm. And one day I drove by with the car and I see, wow, I think there was a sparrow sitting on top there. And it was sitting right on top. And so I went back uh, an hour later with my dog, we were walking, and sure it was a sparrow. So I took the nest out. Went back the next day, 
they had already started on their nest. <laughs> so they're smarter than I am, right? But that particular box had an entrance like this. So I said, oh, I know what, I've got a, a box at home in my workshop that's already got the slot cut like this. I put it on there, two days later it was bluebirds in it. So it does work, doesn't it, Jeff? You'll know a house sparrow's nest is just a mess. Yeah. All the other birds have intricate uh, nests and everything around it, and it's just a mess. And Hershey bar wrappers and all kinds of straws and crap. They, just, they don't. I don't know what why they do that, but they just they're not fussy about it. But this is this. Uh, it's called a K-style box, and there's a guy named Terry Glansman in Mondovi. Mondovi. This is his invention, and he he tries to let more light in too, but it's, it's different than a slot box that has a, has a horizontal. I've never used this, but I made a few of them. I thought maybe someday I'd use it, but I usually use the slot. Um, If you were in the country, most of my houses are on the country. You approach a farmer. I've never heard uh, had a farmer say, "I don't want to do that." So you put your house at least 100 yards from the next one, and then they'll pull their tractor over. How are you doing? You know, ask me how the the nesting is going. So I I don't think you should have to be afraid to ask someone if you want to put a box on our property. I usually use, like I said, the the uh, T-post from Menards, I have a hook driver, I put them in the ground, and then I use a uh, uh, movement downspout that's painted white. And, and the, I have had coons go up that thing, but I think the, one of the keys is to wax it with automobile wax. I think so. So that a squirrel gets on there, he's got to help it out. They slide down, right? Yeah. Um, I can't think of something. I think it's an enjoyable hobby. Uh, uh, at the end of the year, like you said, Lowell, when Bra asks you, when you send in your tally, how many birds you fledged, it's surprising because after they clean a bluebird's house out and they re nest, you keep thinking about the present, you forget what's going on, you know. I use a, I use a slinky. Um, Excuse me? I use a slinky, uh -huh. you know, on the Post? pole for my, to keep oh. the squirrels out of the nest. And it works. Oh. They can't, they can't find oh. oh. I've got a raccoon and figure out. I don't know, because they try to get a hold of it, and it just, it just goes down. That's a good idea. We use conduit. Conduit works Conduit too. works yeah. real good. Yeah. Some of those, well, PVC, I buy a 10-foot length, and you probably say, well, how come you cut some so short? Well, um, because I can get about three out of one 10 foot length. So one of the other things I didn't mention is when you do put the PVC, I used to buy inch and a half PVC and that'll fit pretty good over T posts. Well, now the T posts are a little bigger than an inch and a half. So you can't slide a PVC pipe over the inch and a half. So you have to go two inch. So then you got a little slack in there. And so I put a little wedge and I drive that in and uh, there's a screw right on the back here. And uh, that keeps the uh, wedge right in the nest box. And the reason is, if you get a strong wind, it'll start flipping this around. And all of a sudden, you think you're pointing east and you're going to be pointing west or something. So that's so I've heard bluebirds like moving water. So is a fountain a good idea? Or what, what do you think about water? Oh, they Tree swallows like water. I know at uh, the Little River State Park, with the river going through there, and the, I'm a town person. There's, so. there's uh, a lot of water, and so there's a lot of tree swallows. Uh, there's 33 nest boxes at Little River that I monitor, and uh, usually early in the season, they're pretty much all taken by tree swallows until they fledge, and then the bluebirds come. We have a bird bath right near there, where their house is. They like water, don't they? they? Yeah, they do. And especially in the evening or the late day, they they like to bathe and oh, it's right there. Yeah. So that, you know, there's a good example. Right What's the best thing to put mealworms in? And should it hang? Um, about my neighbor had just a little screen, like you saw in that picture, right. and he had just put it on the ground. Oh. And what he'd go out about eight o'clock every morning, he had a little bell. And when he put the 
mealworms in, he'd bring them back. <laughs> and uh, there was a power line overhead. He said within five minutes, <laughs> the bluebirds would be there, ready for oh, the birds know. Oh, they know yeah. bells, they know people, they, they know all kinds of things. Yeah, that's really fun. fun. They do. And they make special um, stuff out of honey. Yeah. 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 Above-ground feeders to okay. put them in put the little cup in for them. We don't want to leave the cup in this cup for shallow because, you know, they lose footage if they're deep and oh, they're sticking over really deep. But they will, they, they get so time to it that if, I, if I'm not there right away, they'll be sitting there. <laughs> they're like, they want to be where, where is it? Uh -huh. You know, and they can go through a lot of mealworms. Uh -huh. For one fledging, it's mm -hmm. amazing mm -hmm. how many um, worms there are. Did you overfeed them though? Uh, the the male comes know. in and it's funny when he's feeding the female, he'll eat like three and then he'll bring one to her. <laughs> three and then he'll eat like three and then he'll bring one to her. <laughs> one her. <laughs> well, and they say, I don't know, Jim, if you've ever experienced this, after the little babies fledge, where do they go? Well, sometimes they hang around, I think, but a lot of times they don't. I don't know, Kathy, have you noticed where they go? But I've heard that they will sometimes help feed the second batch. Oh, yeah. That's a little bit. I've heard that. And another thing that they say, I have personally, um, you know, when I talked a little bit about the mortality rate, a lady over by Green Bay had gotten permission from the DNR to tag, to put a tag on their life. And she says that she had the same female bluebird come back for seven consecutive years. Oh, wow. So, you know, it was pretty interesting. But I, I don't know if that's in fact true. I know uh, it seemed like when they come back, they'll come back in two, three other times. So it could be there is a whole family that just pulled in. I forgot to mention, uh, don't put... Uh, nest box under a tree where other birds can be around and it's cool talked about the morning sun and it, it's shaded it doesn't warm the house up in the morning but over you know power lines going by and stuff that's a they love that and yeah. I like that they can sit up there and wash their house and nobody can get them <laughs> well it's uh it's a good hobby if you got the time for it and you know if you have it in your yard you can encourage your young people to Get involved with monitoring. Like I say, the, the kids didn't like it. Mm -hmm. And I had written an article for the Bluebird magazine when we had St. Anne's School. That was the first school that I went to. And the kid wanted to go out every day to monitor the nest box. Of course, get out of class for half an hour. <laughs> but I, so I put a large, I said, this is the most heavily uh, monitored trail in the state of Wisconsin. <laughs> uh, I think, I, I'm finished, I don't know. I think you're welcome to come over and take the people out of here.
Thank you.